Did you know that the first commercial oil well specifically designed to produce oil was built right here in the United States? Now we're not talking about it being in Texas, Oklahoma, or even Alaska, but rather the birthplace of the American oil industry is in northwestern Pennsylvania in the city of Titusville. And just 15 miles south of that, in Oil City, is where one of, if not the best, gas-powered engines were produced that revolutionized the industry. And who was the master machinist that improved upon existing patents and designs to produce this engine? Joseph Reed. And today, we're providing you with a brief history lesson on how that engine came about, followed by an exclusive hands-on operating demonstration of a circa 1926 Reed Type A engine. So stick around. There's lots of show and tell and Q&A on this episode of History and Relics. The Drake oil well, named after Colonel Edwin Drake, is often referred to as the first commercial oil well. The Drake produced oil on August 27, 1859 in Titusville, Pennsylvania. The well was drilled to a depth of 69 and a half feet, and it initially produced 25 barrels a day, becoming the first well to produce oil in commercial quantities. However, others seem to make this same claim, of their being the first, including Azerbaijan, Ontario, West Virginia, Persia, Arabia, China, and Poland, among others. So let's discuss that for a moment. In North America, before the U.S.'s Drake well, oil producing wells were wells that were drilled for salt brine or for other purposes and produced oil and gas only as accidental byproducts. An example of this occurred in Ontario, Canada in 1858 when a well there intended for drinking water found oil instead. Historians have noted that the importance of the Drake well was not in being the first well to produce oil, but rather the first to a great wave of investment in oil drilling, refining, and marketing. One kind of engine you were likely to see in the oil fields of Pennsylvania or West Virginia in that era was the Reed II cycle, developed by Joseph Reed. Joseph Reed was an inventor and manufacturer of oil and gas engines and burners. He was born in Scotland in 1843 and was educated there where he learned the machinist trade. He later served a five-year apprenticeship where he thoroughly mastered every detail of the business. At age 20, he came to the United States and continued his trade in Charlestown, Massachusetts. He remained in the Boston area for about a year and a half after which he worked in some of the principal cities and towns around the country, holding the position of a foreman in several large manufacturing establishments and acquiring valuable knowledge and experience he'd later use in his own business. Reed came to Oil City, Pennsylvania in September 1876, which is about 15 miles south of Titusville, and worked a couple of years for a W.J. Innes. In the spring of 1878, he started his own manufacturing business by purchasing an existing company from another of his former employers, Malcolmson and Patterson. The Reed Company built the second foundry that was in Oil City and operated a general foundry and machine business, manufacturing steam engines and sawmill machinery. In 1882, the first locomotive engine built in Oil City was also constructed in his plant. In 1893, Reed became interested in the subject of oil and gas engines which resulted in the designing and perfecting of an engine specially adopted to the wants of the oil industry, which also meant continued growth in staffing from the current 40 to 45 to nearly double that, 
and the expansion of manufacturing facilities which included purchasing nearby property and building a larger foundry and other buildings. Reed began manufacturing his gas engines in 1894 and the first was shipped from Oil City on December 1st of that year. Reed's gas engines were designed especially for running oil well pumping power which greatly diminished if not eliminated the need for steam engines which once ruled. Reed engines were simpler and had fewer moving parts than any gas engine made at that time. Reed's engines were initially manufactured in three sizes to pump from 10 to 40 wells using casing gas and barely any measurable pressure. They had low maintenance and needed little attention other than to make sure that they were oiled every 24 hours. In a few words, Reed's engines were safe, simple, economical, and reliable. Reed's manufacturing plants, one on the corner of Elm and Duncombe and another on Main Street in Oil City, are all gone now. Only a historical placard and a monument of a Reed engine are on site where the buildings once stood as a reminder of Reed's great contribution to the industry. However, if you travel to northwestern Pennsylvania and scour this area's hilltops, steep hillsides, or head deep into the Pennsylvania woods, you might be able to find some remnants of tanks, collapsed engine houses, and long forgotten engines in the once robust oil fields. Most of the old engines left behind are in sad shape, with many parts missing, other parts broken from harsh weather conditions, while others have simply rusted away. However, are you ready to see one in person? Or better yet, see one actually operating in person? Yes? Then you've come to the right place, as we have one of the most popular and most produced Reed engines in our sites today, a Reed Type A. This Reed Type A, built around 1926, features a charging cylinder and a main or drive cylinder, which operates on a two-cycle or two-stroke system, first developed and patented by Scottish engineer Douglas Clark in 1881. This 15 horsepower left-handed workhorse is owned by Donald Lord and Greg Marazzi of Bristolville, Ohio. And we're going to have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their read, how they found it, got it working, and will provide you a live hands-on operating demonstration. This duo's experience is homegrown and self-taught for the most part. But that's where you come in, as Don and Greg share with you their tips and tricks, they also want to hear from you about yours. So without further ado, here's Don and Greg. Introductions first. My name is Don. This is my neighbor, Greg. That's why the science here says we're good neighbors and great friends. We, we kind of started on this entire project together. Mostly my fault. Greg was over at my place one day looking at some of the old hit and miss engines that I had. Seen an auto with drag saw laying up against the barn. Decided to sell it to him. He took it home. After that, it was downhill from there. He got the rusty iron bug. Wanted another engine. I think he got a Hercules after that. Yeah. And then, uh, I don't know how many more engines he got now, but just a few. Just just a few, but not enough. <laughs> and that's and that's usually how it goes. Greg came to me one day. He found the engine listed in what gas engine? Gas mag engine, Jim. Yeah. Gas engine magazine. And that's one of those magazines all the engine people get. And it was advertised down in West Virginia someplace. Do you remember the name of the town? Salem. Down near Salem, West Virginia. So we got in the car together. We're going to go down there and take a look at this thing. It was the Reed engine that was being advertised. This one right here. And we got down there, and I'm looking at an old Reed engine with the timbers rotted out from underneath of it, leaning off to one side. Looked like it had been sitting in the water. And I'm shaking my head at Greg. He said, really? <laughs> this thing doesn't, wasn't, wasn't in the best of shape. But we bought it. And again, that's one of those team things. I don't think by myself I had enough resources to get an engine like this and put it together without help from neighbor Greg. Because he had a lot of equipment that I needed, like being able to set it on the trailer, do the welding that needed to be done. Connections to haul it. Connections to haul it. That was another thing, getting it up out of the, out of the ditch with enough winches and everything else like that. But it did. It came out of West Virginia, out of a mountainside, near a creek, almost going back into the water again, and we, we were able to salvage it. Now, the gentleman that had the engine, uh, he had pulled it down off the mountainside and had it in his backyard by that time. So he was the first one. Do you remember his name? Uh, Bates. 
Bates was the last name. Bates was the last name. So that family deserves the original yep. accolades for having saved the engine from destruction. We did a little bit of work to it. There's a little bit of house paint on it, as you can see. That's how we found it. We didn't paint it. They haven't painted anything, but he was doing a little bit of house paint work on everything, trying to get, uh, get it set up. I don't know if he ever had it running, but we had to buy a whole bunch of extra parts to get to that point. So that, that's how he and I got involved in the engine. So between some help from me, a lot of help from Greg, this is the result. The canopy, the engine, the trailer, and it's still growing. Plan to put more stuff on the flat rock please. We'll talk a little bit about that. Right now, I've got it all uncovered, and the first thing I want to do to get the engine started is to put a flame underneath the hot tube. Now, for those who don't understand the hot tube, it's the hollow tube capped on the outside, goes down into the engine, compression comes up, shoves a little bit of gas inside that thing, and with the gas flame underneath it, getting that tube cherry red, it'll ignite the gas and fire the engine. We've got propane tanks that we're using to run the engine. Now, originally, the engine ran off the natural gas off the wellhead, because this was an oil well type engine. Ran in the oil fields, either pump the oil or help drill the, drill the oil. So that was one of the learning curves that I needed. How much gas does it take to heat up that hot tube? And on this system here, this is just for the hot tube. The other system is to run the engine. So I'm going to crank this one on. And my gauge has shown me that I have a little bit of gas in here. It's full. I'm going to open up my ball valve. And you see it comes up to about 2 pounds of PSI. After a little bit of uh, trial and error and heating the tube up and watching the color of the tube, and we'll talk about the color of the tube a little bit later, but I found that if I run that tube at about 2 PSI, I get just the right amount of heat that I need at the hot tube. The engine itself runs on this one. Crack that one open. I got plenty of gas. Get that one opened up. I use the bowel valves just in case they have an emergency shut off. Now you notice that's down quite a bit. That's from the last time we ran the engine. To start the engine, I usually need about three and a half pounds of pressure to start. And after the engine runs a little bit and gets warmed up, you can actually cut this back down to about one. And at the end of the day, when everything's running really perfect, I was almost down to about half a pound. But on a normal run, on a normal day, I'm usually want about a pound, pound and a half of pressure. That's, that's just on a normal run. So I'm going to shut this off for now because I uh, need to heat the hot tube and it's going to take a few minutes. First thing I do after I do this is go over and let's uh, light the hot tube. So this is the chimney. The hot tube's down inside, goes down, makes an angle, goes into, into the engine head. To see down in here, you need a mirror once, once the flame is up. But right now there's gas here and I'm going to light this thing up. Don't know if you can hear that, but it's making the chimney sound coming up through. So that needs to warm up. Now while we're here, this valve here, that's the air pressure off the engine head. We used this originally to get the engine started. We used air pressure to push the piston around to get enough strokes that I could dial the thing in, figure out how much gas I needed, how hot the tube is. So it took us a while doing that. Air pressure going in, cycle back and forth, open and close the valve to make sure it goes. And it took us, what, a day? A day of messing around before we finally dialed in the right combination, how hot the tube is how much gas is being fed, fed into the thing. Close that valve and she fired right up. Now it took a few more days after that to get it all happened again. Because <laughs> it's, it's one of those things, okay, the very balanced of how much air and how much gas. Uh, but we did finally get to the point that we could do that on a regular basis. And I still use this to start the engine. Release the pressure off of it. Use our fancy little engine starter, which I'll talk about in a minute. Close that thing up when it fires, and then she's off and running. So this is the carburation as it occurs. 
the gas line coming in here. This is air coming in here. Inside this thing, there's supposed to be supposed to be two little valves. Yeah, they were froze up and stuck and almost rusted and gone by the time we got to it. it fell out in pieces. So we had to take all the guts out of it. So instead of the valves regulating the amount of air, I made a little damper on the outside of this to regulate the amount of air going into it. A needle valve over here to regulate the amount of gas. And that needle valve is just kind of staying right where it's at because it's been dialed in. Like I said back on the uh, on the propane tank, I found out I needed to start about three and a half pounds of pressure to start it. So I don't move that and I don't move this anymore because I got it dialed in. The guts are in here are all gone, kind of bypassed all, all that. It used to be a throttling governor type engine, which means the fly ball governor on the side here open the valves as needed if it needed uh, more RPMs and it's RPM regulated. If needed R more RPMs or less RPMs, under load would slow down. So it would say we need more RPMs, we'd open up the gas valve, add a little more gas to it, bring it back up to speed, try to hold the RPMs. We got running away too fast, this was supposed to close it back down again to slow the RPMs back down. So all this linkage under here that's not there, that's what that did. Eventually I'd like to get back to doing all that. Uh, I do have another uh, regulation, regulating system, carburation, with all the linkages and the valves are free. I'm working on that for a little bit. That's basically the fly ball governor, move the valves, trying to maintain RPMs on the engine. So gas, the tank there is an accumulator tank. I don't know if the original engines had the accumulator type tank to it. We needed that because every time this thing strokes, it takes this much volume of gas and air before it shoves it into the other side to fire this piston. So for, looks like about a 12 inch stroke, it comes back, sucks up air and, air, air and gas, about nine inches in diameter or whatever it is, shoves that entire volume over to the other side into the piston side of the engine to get it to fire. In the day when the engines were first put out there, oil well, this is called a gasomatic. Greg found this at uh, gasometer. 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 So it was used to regulate the amount of gas going into the engine. This thing would float up here like this, and when the engine would suck some gas, it would drop down, open this valve up, so it would float back up again and then feed the gas to it. So that's kind of a replacement for our accumulator tank. This is what it might have looked like in the first place. It was an old pressure gauge because the weight of this thing kind of controlled the amount of pressure that was going into the thing. That's an original. That's an original gas meter. Not hooked up yet. Don't know if we're ever going to get to that point. That's one of the things I'm worried about. Yeah, is it, is it safe? Will it hold gas? Will it leak all over the place? I'm not so thrilled about hooking it all back up again, but there's, we got one. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to go around and start, uh, Greg and I are going to start going around and putting all the oilers on there. One of the curious oilers that we have, this one's called a lollipop. Oil gets in here, and as this thing's flying around, the gravity's supposed to sling the oil down into, into the wrist pin here to oil that up. That oiler there is called a uh, milk can type oiler. I'm not sure that if the combination is supposed to be there like that, but that's what we ended up with. This was original to the engine. This is a repop that we had to buy somewhere along the line. It's not original to the engine. Eventually an oiler is going to go up there and go down and, and feed that. Water circulation system. Stole this off an old orchard sprayer way back when. It has been sitting in my barn for God, 25 years. Didn't know I was going to use it for it, but it got uh, brought into service to circulate water to, uh, for the engine. It's about 80 gallons worth of water in there. That's an old hot water tank. Greg found it. We cut the top of it off. Ended up making a uh, screen for, for the top of it and stuck a shower head on there just for fun and fancy.
line shaft system belted off the engine drives the line shaft which drives the pump and again that's one of those things that was laying around in the garage for a lot of years trying to figure out what to do with it then all of a sudden we had a big use for the thing and I'm, and I'm still looking for some more line shafts I got other things I want to hook up get belted up to the engine this is a clutch pulley that I found years ago just like I found the water pump years ago the orchard sprayer pump didn't know what I was going to use it for but it's been sitting in the barn waiting for something to come along had to make a plate had to put a shaft on the plate weld it up screw it to the flywheel this is not original equipment to read this is a reed engine it's a type 1a type reed. the original clutch was big and very wide and very long and very heavy I think it weighed over a thousand pounds by itself couldn't get it on the trailer so I wanted something smaller that I could hook up and drive the pulleys with. This is waiting for some other apparatus to come along and get hooked up to it. But did the belts. Now I chose to put a lot of slop in this belt because the way this engine runs it's not a smooth running engine like a four stroke engine. Every once in a while slow down, start firing, hit hard keep all that torque from driving back through the belts and into my pulley system put a little slot there and allow it to bounce every time it fires so that's on purpose if you guys know a better bit, bit, a bit better way to do this let me know because I'm always looking for suggestions typical oilers found on the oil well engines not necessarily uh, something you would put on a reed but, uh, same thing big pot control the amount of drips screw on the top lock it in with, with this on there see how much oil's on the inside of it looks like I need to put a little more oil in there it's got some but it'll be enough for today's run just for fun I found these at an antique show keeps the hole plugged up so I don't get dirt down in there. Yeah, it's a magnetic, magnetic ball. Where are you going to go? Your side. side notes this is a reed type 1a the type type a engine this one was built according to the numbers on the castings we think about 1926 so all those extra oilers up there and there are some extra oilers up there this actually had chain links driving on the uh, journals for the crank for the outside cranks so there really doesn't need to have all those two oilers on the side 
but it makes it look great when it's on, on the engine show when I got the, with the oilers on there. Just check the tube a little bit. It's about the right temperature. And as I said, about two pounds of pressure. The time it takes me to go around and put all the oilers on here, Greg, Greg, it's, Greg helped out on one side, I got the other. In that amount of time, most always, that's enough time to get the tube hot enough. It takes about uh, 10 to 15 minutes to make sure the tube's hot enough to get it started. Let me go around and flip the oilers on because we're going to start the engine now. So this is a Honda engine that came off of a cement mixer. It's one of the great innovations made by Greg. Yeah, we're, I'm getting a little bit old to grab hold of the flywheels and start this thing. Traditionally, you're supposed to pull it and run backwards so it would backfire. And then hopefully you'd add enough momentum to carry through to get the engine started. So we're not going to step on the flywheel today and we're not going to uh, back bump it uh, today. Uh, today we're going to use our reliable Honda engine that come off a cement mixture with a gear reduction motor in it on the side so it doesn't turn the flywheels too fast. Turned out everything about this was exactly right what we needed to push that flywheel around using, using the Honda motor. Again, I'm not going to be able to pull on that engine and, and, and bump start it. Although uh, Greg and I are still working on that. We want to get to that uh, point someday. But as for, for right now, we're still on the learning curve trying to figure out how to make a bunch of this stuff work. And this, this is one of the great innovations Greg come up with. Hear that Melbourne schmucker? I need your help. <laughs> All right. Good. Turn the gas on for the engine. Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> because it's where it's peeling rubber on the flywheel. Okay, fire me up. Turns out that uh, somewhere along the line when we walked past it, we moved the air that was up to here. 
this is where it's supposed to sit. We'll try again. I think we found the answer.
So it's listening to the engine a little bit. It was hitting a little bit harder and firing too hard for what we need. I like to keep the engine running slow. It's done its work in the past. It doesn't, just needs to idle now. On the technical side, I worry about metal fatigue. Flywheel's moving too fast, things breaking apart on it. So I want to turn it down a little bit. Turn it down to about two, or just a little bit less. I can hear the engine run just a little bit more even. And firing just about right with the amount of air, air and gas I got going in there. I'm down just a little bit on the burner side, the hot tube, but not by much. About one and three quarters PSI. Watch my gauges here to make sure I got enough gas to uh, run. This 25 pound bottle, 20 pound bottle, I can usually run about six hours before it starts to empty out. At that time, the, the bottle will start to freeze because it's sucking so much gas directly from the bottle. The bottom of it begins to freeze up, freeze the gas up. So if I shut it down, warm the tank up a little bit, I could probably get another hour out of it. And the engine will do that sometimes, so it decides, ah, oh, I don't want to work so hard. It takes a breather. Not sure why it does that. If you guys know, I want to know, because I'm looking for some of that expertise from everybody out there. What I've done and what I've learned on this engine has been self-taught. Maybe I'm not right on some things. Maybe I should be doing something a little bit better. For God's sakes, please tell me, because all I want to do is make sure this engine stays alive for as long as I, I'm around and probably long afterwards. When I'm done, Craig is going to get the engine and he's still going to go to the engine shows. So hopefully this engine will last for years to come. But I need some help. Don't shut these down now. All I do is start turning the gas off. Alright, we've closed the engine down. The purpose of this whole video is to try and share what I've learned. It may not be right. Some of these settings that I use may not work on your engine when you give it a try. But it was a starting point. And that was one of the hardest things for me to find, either on YouTube or some people who knew how to do that. Where was the starting point on my gas pressure? Where was the starting point on my air? So a lot of things Greg and I had to learn the hard way by running that thing with air pressure trying to get it to roll over and get it to fire for the first time and try to start dialing in all the gas. So I'm just sharing today, the, air, uh, the gas pressures may not be the same as yours, but that's what we learned to use on this one. Uh, the amount of air going in, the intakes, how hot to make the tube. Again, that's not something that I think is going to be consistent with every engine. Everyone, everyone's going to be a little bit different, but I just wanted to share starting points of what we did in rebuilding the engine, trying to get it to run. Type of orders we use, type of starting method that we use. Cheat, I know. <laughs> and Greg is running around shutting down all the oilers for us so we don't uh, swamp the thing with oil in there. Also, the hot tube, you don't want it too red hot or cherry hot, but you don't want it orange. That's too much heat. More like a, like a dull cherry red, huh, Don? That's, yeah. Orange is too advanced. You, you don't want to run it that hot. More like a dull cherry red. 
That's what we found on this engine. Not an expert on this, but logic tells me if you get this thing red, uh, too cherry red hot, the engine's going to fire too quick. It's like advancing the typing. If it's too cold, it's not may, may not fire soon enough. That's another one of those variables you got to take into account when you when you're trying to start the engine. Try to get a good color, find out if it's firing quick enough or not not enough. That may be part of our issue with that, that we're not bump starting it. Maybe we're too cold, or we, maybe we're not hot enough on the tube. You guys know? Let me know, because I really want to get to that point someday. Starting it by hand, bump starting it just like it used to be back in the day. Also, the accumulator tank. There's guys running them without the accumulator tanks. Melvern Schmucker has an 8 horse reed and a 15 horse reed. He doesn't have an accumulator tank on either one of those. He's got a smaller uh, adjustment on his uh, gas. Might be what allows him to do that without an accumulator tank, but this is what a lot of people run. It don't have to be just like this, but that's what we come up with. <laughs> All right, guys. I got. I think I've said everything I needed to say. And again, I need your help. Time to put this baby back to bed. Maybe uh, close it down for the winter time. Going to start taking the parts off the front of it, drain the water, make sure it's warm, warm the thing up maybe a little bit to, to get the interior dried out. We're going to dump a little antifreeze. RV antifreeze into the tank. I don't want to kill any animals. In other words, putting it to bed for the winter time because I don't think we're going to end up going to another show yet this year. See you guys out on the road. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed our program. If you like our content, we ask that you like, share, and subscribe to our channel. It costs nothing but means a lot to us and keeps us growing. You may also leave us a tip if you choose. A link is provided here on your screen as well as in the description area below. And until next time, everyone, this one is history.